Okay. Hello. Um, all right, so I'm just going to pick up where I did last time. I mean, pick up where I... Where are my pens? Pick up where I left off last time. So, um, I was saying that there's kind of four problems or issues that Carnap um, is using the constructional system to address all of them, um, and thereby also claiming that they're sort of the same problem. They have the same solution. So the, the first one is a problem about logic and set theory. The problem that Carnap mentions at the beginning of the preface where he says that, you know, mathematicians were forced to develop a new logic because the old one landed them in contradictions. So I'm going to just actually go into some detail today explaining what that actually is. And then the second one is an issue about ontology, um, about what kind, what different kinds of being there are. Um, and he's dealing with a traditional doctrine according to which there are many different kinds of being. He's even dealing with a fairly traditional form of it, although I think he um, has got it not from ancient Neoplatonists or somewhere like that, but from Husserl. So, um, I mean, what's the problem there? Just to say that there is such a structure isn't itself a problem, but it, it's connected to, to the other problems in a way I'll explain. So the third one is a problem about language, about the meaningfulness of language. Before we start deciding whether something we say is true or false, we better be sure it's meaningful. And the question is, how do we do that? What draws the boundary between meaningful and meaningless? Um, uh, how do we do that without first knowing what's true? Because we can't start figuring out what's true until we already know what's meaningful. And the fourth one is the one that's most relevant to this course, obviously. It's a problem about science. And it's, um, it's a, it's, or I guess I said last time it's a problem about epistemology, but it's a problem about epistemology that's raised actually, I guess, especially by at least, oh, yes, the whiteboard camera is frozen and I'm writing stuff on the board. Why does that always happen? Could it be fixed by killing the USB demon? Does this mean I'm going to also have the other thing again where everything freezes? I don't know. There we go. That's what I was writing. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. Um, right? It's a problem about epistemology that was ra that's raised, as, I guess, especially by modern science, although certainly not only by modern science, about, you know, what gives us the right to talk about things that we can't be directly acquainted with? When is that okay, and when is it not okay? Okay, so like I said, I'm going to start by talking about this one, and then I'm going to hopefully explain how Carnap thinks it's related to all the other ones and how the constructional system is the right way to address all of them. So, I mean, before I get to the actual contradiction, where it comes from, 
want to talk about propositional functions and classes and relation extensions. Um, so, um, and it's easiest to understand this if we concentrate on what before I was calling concepts in a narrow sense. Carnap actually calls them properties. Propositional, well, I mean, okay. Um, things that are true or false of some of any given object. That is, um, things that, so to speak, need an object or the name of the object to get something true or false. Right? So, like, rows, or I could write it this way. Is a rose by itself is not true or false? Actually, maybe I should write it there. Rose by itself is not true or false. That's a concept, and in particular, a concept, a one place concept or property. Um, it's not true or false by itself, but um, it truly or falsely describes various things, right? Because some things are roses and some things are not roses. So if you give me any particular thing, then I can use that thing and this concept or property, rose, to get a proposition or statement that's either true or false. And, you know, I do it by putting it into a sentence this way. Right? I make a sentence that says, is a rose, and then you give me something like this pen, and I plug it, or rather its name, into this space here. So say this pen's name is Fred. So I write in Fred. Fred is a rose, and uh, Fred is this pen so, pen, so Fred is not a rose. So this gives you a statement, and it's a statement that's false. I have some, I don't really have a rose here. I need more props, I guess. But if I had something that wasn't rose and I named it Ned, then I could plug its name into here and I would get Ned as a rose and that would be true. Um, and this is why Carnap, and again, he's not the first one to do this. He's following with certain changes. Uh, following Frege, I guess he's directly following Russell and the way he explains this. Um, Carnap says, this is why Carnap says a property, a one place concept like this, is a propositional function. Which means it's a function from objects or names of objects to propositions or statements. Right now, I mean, if you remember, like, from math, what it means that I have a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, right? So, like I say, f of x equals x squared. So, it means, you know, give me a real number and I'll give you another one back. And I have a rule to do it by and the rule is the function, right? So you can give me two, I give you four, if you, you know, et cetera, right? So this is a function from objects to propositions. You give me an object like Fred and I give you back a proposition. Fred is a rose. Okay, is that clear so far? Is it clear why we're calling these things propositional functions? Are there any questions about that? Okay, so, um, so if we have a function like this, or so another, so rows, 
you know, like, I guess I say this function, x is a rose. Here, another example might be uh, x is a natural number. Right? This is the thing last time I wrote as n. Um, so if we have a propositional function like this, we can use it to um, make a distinction between objects that yield true propositions when they're plugged in and objects that use false pro that yield false propositions when we put them in. Right? So like this one, if you give if if you give it one or two or three or four or any of those things, it gives you a proposition like one is a natural number, two is a natural number, all those are true propositions. If you give it something like Fred, this pen, um, then it gives you the proposition Fred is a natural number. That presumably is false, although there's something a little weird about it. It seems like it's worse than false. Or on the other hand, maybe we don't know if it's really, I mean, who knows what numbers are. Maybe this pen is a number, right? But anyway, like I said, it's presumably it's something false. Or if I give it <coughs> two thirds, I think we can agree that's some two thirds is a natural number. That's false. Um, and we can think, right? So we're distinguishing between objects that as we might say, this, this property inheres in, or this uh, property belongs to, or this concept applies to, applies correctly to, right? Um, and the other ones that, uh, that don't have this property that um, this concept doesn't apply to. Um, uh, and, or in other words, again, we're distinguishing between the objects that yield true propositions as values from this function and the ones that yield false ones. And we can think of all the ones that yield true propositions together as making up a certain kind of like group or set or class, which is the term that Carnap is going to use here, a certain class of objects, the class of all objects that make this particular, that when you apply this propositional function to them, you get true propositions. And so we call the class that for short, I could say the class of objects that make this come out true, we call it the extension of the property or the propositional function. So the extension of this function is the class of all things that when you plug them into x and x is a rose, yield a true proposition. That is, it's the class of all things that have the property of being a rose. That is, it's the class of all roses, right? Whereas uh, the extension of this property or propositional function is the class of all natural numbers. And uh, Carnap adopts the following notation for extensions. Um, for the extension of n, we write the name of the variable with a hat over it, and then the expression. So you could also write that x, x, the extension of propositional function x is a rose, the extension of the propositional function n of x. 
right? I mean, the reason you need to write the variable out here is that sometimes in more complicated cases, there might be more than one variable in the expression, and you're only taking the extension one way, so to speak, and not the other. Um, I'm not going to deal with examples. I'm not going to deal with examples like that, but um, um, but still, this is the um, notation that Carnap uses. Um, so I'm going to use it. It's also, you know, if you have a relation with more than one place, then you need to keep track of which variable is the first member and which is the second member of the relation. But um, so there, there are reasons why the variable has to be there, right? Um, okay, so that's the notation for extension. And one other piece of notation, this one I hope more familiar, is what's known as set epsilon or the set membership relation. So this actually, um, Giuseppe Piano, who I mentioned the piano axiomatization of arithmetic before. So he was the one who actually introduced this notation first, and originally it stood for the Latin word est. Right? So it's like if we say um, A is a member of the extension of rows, that's a way of saying A is a rose, right? So that's, that's how this symbol was chosen, but never mind that. In fact, it's probably better to forget that. <laughs> um, uh, so when we write A is a member of B, Um, we mean A is one of the objects in the class B. So, for example, if B is the extension of some propositional function, uppercase B, we write A is a member of this. then this is exactly the same as saying this, the propositional function with A plugged in. Right? So, for example, if phi is the propositional function, x is a rose, and I say A is a member of the extension of the propositional function, x is a rose, I mean that when you plug A into the x and x is a rose, you get a true proposition. So the true proposition you get is A is a rose. <laughs> That's what's represented here by the phi of A. Right, so saying this is the same, asserting this is the same as asserting this. They're either both true or both false. If it's true that A is a member of the extension of the propositional function X is a rose, then it's true that A is a rose and vice versa. Right, and this this equivalence is really really important to Carnap because this is what's going to allow us to um, get rid of all these names of classes. We're going to have a long, complicated statement that contains the names of certain classes in them, and Carnap wants to get rid of them. And again, he's following Russell on this, Russell's so-called no-class theory. We want to get rid of all the names of classes, and the way we're going to do it is manipulate the statement until the names of classes only occur in contexts like this, and then replace everything that looks like this by something that looks like that. And now, this, um, there are only names of objects 
that the propositional function is applied to no names of classes. So that's why this equivalence is so important. But there's nothing particularly deep about it, right? It's just, this is just what we mean by saying that A is part of the extension of phi. It means that phi applies truly to A. Okay, are there questions about that? I looked at the chat. Is there a significant difference between a set and a class? Uh, um, <laughs> first of all, that's a good question. <laughs> Second of all, uh, there is, but uh, what the differences may depend on who's talking. Carnap himself at one point said, here says that class is a logical concept, whereas set belongs to set theory. Um, but in another place, he seems to say that set and class are basically synonyms. So I don't know that he's being that careful about it. But if you were to be careful about it, you may say something like this, that a class has to be defined by a propositional function, at least one propositional function. As I'll say in a second, if it's defined by one propositional function, it's going to be defined by lots of propositional functions. But a class has to be defined by some propositional function. Whereas in set theory proper, so to speak, like mathematical set theory, you can prove that there are a lot more sets than there are um, propositions that I could write. Um, so, uh, so it can't be that every set can be defined by some propositional function. Um, so that would be the difference. Having said that, I'm not going to talk about that again because I think for the purposes of this class it's just confusing. You can think of class and set as basically synonymous here. Annabelle's question. So he wants the class name roses to be reworded as all objects with the property of being a rose. Well, um, he like call the set of all roses R. He wants to be able to take all statements that contain R and replace them with statements that contain, that, that talk about things that either are or are not roses, <laughs> but doesn't talk about the class of all roses. Um, I, you know what, I'm going to give you an example. Maybe should I go ahead and give that example first? No, I don't, I think I'm going to still... Well, maybe I should give this example now since the question has come up. Just to, sh to show, and this is the current example Carnap uses too, just to show how this is going to work. So with names of classes, I can say various things about relationships between classes that are not directly relations between things like roses, right? So like if I let S R be the class of all roses, and I let um, F be the class of all flowers. Then I can write these set theory type things like R is a subset of F. Hopefully you've seen something like that in like math classes or whatever, right? R is a subset of F. Like, um, if I want, if I just wanted to replace R with all roses and say all roses are subsets of F, that wouldn't be true, right? Roses are not sets. They're not subsets of anything. Ryan asks, is this related to his consideration of classes as fictitious quasi-objects? Yes, exactly. It is, it's it's the, the same as that, basically. But let me, but let me go back to this example. Right, so like, so I can't get rid of this symbol R just by plugging, just by like throwing all the roses at it, right? <laughs> like, like um, the hole made out of all roses everywhere. 
or each row is one after another or whatever, those things are not going to make this statement true if I put them in here. Because, again, roses are not sets, and the ro hole made out of all roses is not a set. It's some, like, big disconnected thing, <laughs> right? Um, so it's not a subset of the set of all flowers. So to get rid of the names of classes, we have to do something a little bit more complicated. And what we do is, first of all, get the statement into a form where all the class names occur in, in a way that looks like this. Right, so in this case, it's pretty easy. R is a subset of F means that for all X, if X is a member of R, then I think I was using a different symbol for implies before. You should get used to that. People use different logical symbols, but I think I was using this one that Carnap uses. Only it's confusing because it's so close to the subset. Right, let me go back to this. So it means for all x, if x is a member of R, then x is a member of F. Right? That's what it means that R is, that R is a subset of F. Every member of R is also a member of F. Not necessarily vice versa. So so far we still have the names of the classes. We haven't gotten rid of them yet. But this was a this was a necessary step to get them all all the names of the classes to only occur in places that look like that. Then if they really are classes in the way I was saying that like technically the word class I guess means namely that for each of them we know a propositional function that defines them that they're the that they are the extension of then we can get rid of all these things and that happens by that trick I was showing before right so we so we first replace this with For all x, if x is a member of the extension of x is a rose, then x is a member of the extension of x is a flower. And then we remember that x is a member of the extension of a propositional function is just the same I guess I shouldn't have used X again before, should I? <laughs> All right. So, so we know that saying that X is a member of the extension of the propositional function is blank is a rose is the same as saying that X is a rose. So then we change this to for all x, if x is a rose, then x is a flower. And now the names of the classes are gone. But we haven't replaced them by something that says, like, all roses everywhere. I mean, we have in a way, but only in the way that there's a quantifier out here over x. There isn't a symbol here that means all roses everywhere. Is that is that somehow somewhat clear how that worked? How we got we went from this to this to this to this. And yes, in answer to Ryan's question, this is what Carnap means by saying that the names of classes are names of fictitious quasi-objects. Um, because um, we can get rid of those names and still be saying the same thing. 
in some sense. In what sense? Well, um, if this is true, then this is true, and vice versa. They're logically equivalent. They're either both true or both false. So if that's what we care about, we didn't need names for these objects, and so we weren't really talking about them. So Annabelle asks, so you're still using the words rose and flower, but now they are properties and not class names. Yeah, well, so I tried to be careful here and not use rose and flower as the names of the classes. Um, I mean, it is pretty common to do that, you know, to call, like to call the class of all classes rose <laughs> um, would be convenient. But uh, it would be confusing because you wouldn't be able to tell what happened here. Right? I mean, this is not, doesn't mean the same thing as the word rose. Like, if I say X is a rose, I mean it's a member of this, not that it is that. So it, it really, they really are two different words, but they're closely related, and this is the relationship. All right. Um, okay, so back to what I was going to say. So there's, so there's two things I want to note about classes. Um, the first one is that um, many propositional functions correspond to the same class in general. Right, so you know, there's all this. I think when I bought this whiteboard, it came with some kind of cleaner cooler or something. It's all gone. Let's get a new one. I think I bought it at Target, and that Target has just had a fire and it's closed. Um, <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, right. So, like, if you take, for example, so here are two different propositional functions. X is an odd prime number. And X is a prime number greater than 2. So... Those are, those are different propositional functions. How can I tell they're different propositional functions? When you plug something in for the x, you get different propositions. For one, you get, if I plug in uh, 3 for the x, I get 3 is an odd prime number. For the other, if I plug in 3, I get 3 is a prime number greater than 2. So these are two different propositional functions, two different properties. But of course, whatever makes one true will make the other true and vice versa. Right, so if I plug in three here, I get true because three is an odd prime number. If I plug in three here, I get true because 3 is a prime number and it's greater than 2. If I plug in 2 for both of them, I get false for both of them because 2 is a prime number but it's not odd and it's not greater than 2. If I plug in 4, I get false for both of them because 4 is not a prime number, etc. So even though they're different propositional functions, they have the same extension. So these are not the same propositional function, but when I write this out in front of both of them, I get the same thing. These two classes are the same, or there aren't two classes. <laughs> it's the same class. Okay, so that's, that's one thing I wanted to point out. So, I mean, and the reason, I guess, one reason I'm pointing out is because you might think, class, propositional function, they're really just the same thing. But the way Carnap understands that they, at least they're not the same thing, although again, they're closely related to each other. 
right? Every propositional function defines a class, and every class is defined by a propositional function, but the relationship is not one-to-one. -one. Every class is defined by a lot of different propositional functions, whereas every propositional function only defines one class. It's extension, right? So, like, different propositional functions have the same extension, but every propositional function only has one extension. Okay, so that's one thing. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that, um, which, and these are both points that Carnap makes in the reading, but I'm pointing them out in the lecture. So the other is that the class is what Carnap calls a logical complex of its members that is not a whole composed of its members. Right, and you can see this from the same example I discussed last week, and it's also this example Carnap uses. One of the examples he uses in the reading, the other is something about a dog and its organs, which is kind of gross, so I'm going to stick with the wall. So, like, you know, if I say, um, I'm going to replace these two functions now by. X is a brick in this wall, and X is an atom in this wall. So these two propositional functions, number one, are not the same, obviously. They don't give you the same propositions, but number two, they're, they um, they're never both true of the same thing, right? So in other words, if there's something, um, um, if there's something, call it Fred, such that when I put it in here, I get Fred as a brick in this wall, and it's true, then I know that I plug it in here, I'm going to get something false, right? Because bricks are not atoms, and atoms are not bricks. <laughs> so, um, so the classes, the extension of this propositional function and the extension of this propositional function, not only are they not the same class, but they don't overlap at all, right? Nothing belongs to both of them. Because to belong to both of them would have to both be a brick in this wall and an atom in this wall, and nothing could be both of those. So these are completely disjunct classes. They're certainly not the same class. But the whole composed of the members of this class is the same as the whole composed of the members of that class, namely the wall. Right? That is, if you take all the members of this class and glom them together into a whole, you get the wall. And if you take all the members of this class and glom them together into a whole, you get the same wall. So different classes, same whole, that shows that the class is not the whole. Okay, so someone asked me in a, a direct message, is this a continuation of Phil 9 or is this a review of what we learned in Phil 9? I don't know exactly what you learned in Phil 9, so I don't teach Phil 9, but um, it would be nice if you already saw all of this in Phil 9. I, I, I don't know how much you go into like this extension notation and stuff like that, and the difference in holes and classes. And I, I'm not, I, I don't know. But if it is a review, great. <laughs> okay, someone else said, I saw none of this in film. Okay, so I don't know. It, it, not only do I not teach film nine, but it's not always the same person who teaches it, so you might see different things. Okay, anyway, um, um, these are things that, I mean, these are ways of thinking about the relationship between set theory and logic that you probably wouldn't see presented exactly the same way in Phil, Phil 9 because people don't think about them exactly the same way that people did when Carnap was writing. So, um, 
Um, so this is probably more of a review of the history of the stuff you learned in Film 9. But again, I don't know for sure. It probably depends on how it's taught. Okay, and I'll just add one more thing, which is that Carnap thinks of relation extensions as something that's similar to classes, only, so to speak, more complicated, right? So, um, so he writes relations like this. So you can think of the relation as being between the two arguments. As I mentioned last time, that stops working pretty quickly if there's more than two arguments. <laughs> you can't put the relation between all three of them. Um, but all right, just to make it look more like him, I can write it this way. So, right, this is like a propositional function that takes two arguments, but um, they have to go in the right order. Um, right? So, like, is greater than. Um, if you give me two numbers in a certain order, we'll give, I can give you back a proposition that's either true or false, right? So you give me two, three, I give you back two is greater than three and it's false. You give me three, two, I give you back three is greater than two and it's true. So the order matters, right? So we can think of this thing as, so, so the, relation extension we can think of as kind of it's like a class but rather than just objects it contains ordered pairs of objects now i mean why you shouldn't say it just is a class but all its members are ordered pairs of objects is you know i mean that is like the way people think of it more now but there's reasons why Frege and Russell and Carnap don't want to think of it that way. So instead they think of it as kind of a generalization of the idea of a class. Um, this is, to actually understand what Carnap does in the Aufbau, this is actually more important because almost everything he does ends up using relations ex extensions, not just classes. Um, but to understand the basic issues here, we don't have to worry about this at the moment. So just, I'm gonna go back to thinking about properties that only take one argument. It's much simpler to understand in the class that is their extension. So the foundation crisis that, in, that Carnap is talking about um, is um, that this simple way of thinking about classes and relations that I just outlined, that seems, I hope, pretty, I want to say intuitive. Intuition is a really tricky term, uh, probably one best avoided, but uh, it seems innocent. Um, we're just saying that, yeah, some things can have something in common and I can say what they have in common and then I can talk about that and whatever. Um, nevertheless, it turns out that this simple way of thinking about classes and relations is not self-consistent. It leads to contradictions. So it actually leads to lots of contradictions, but the famous contradiction that it leads to is called the Russell Paradox. I think uh, in some sense all the, all the paradoxes of set theory are the same paradox, but... Uh, maybe in some sense not. I don't know. Anyway, the famous one is the Russell Paradox. And this is, let me actually erase these. So the Russell Paradox. So to get the Russell Paradox, um, you start just by thinking this, that it seems like some classes are members of themselves. Most are not, right? Like the class of all roses is not a rose. The class of all natural numbers is not a natural number. Um, but it seems like some classes are members of themselves. So simplest example, let u be the extension of this propositional function. Right, the propositional function S is a X is a class. 
I mean, we can't say this is not a propositional function, can we? We've just been talking about classes, right? Saying, suppose this is a class and this is a class, then I can do this and I can do that, right? So I'm constantly using this propositional function. So it should have an extension, call its extension u, and then it's clear that u must be a member of itself, right? Because if you plug u in here, you get u as a class. And being the extension of a propositional function, u is a class, right? So you get something true. So u is one of the things that makes this function give you a true proposition. So, and that's what this notation, remember, that's all it means. So u is a member of itself. Okay, so far there's no paradox. But um, now, as I pointed out, u is kind of unusual. Maybe u stands for unusual. <laughs> no, I don't know. Actually, u stands for universe, I think, in this context. But in any case, uh, u is kind of unusual. Like the normal classes we think about don't belong to themselves. I mean, um, uh, U isn't the only one that belongs to itself, but it's, you know, but a lot of ones we can think of don't belong to themselves. So, um, so we can make a distinction between classes that do belong to themselves and classes that don't belong to themselves. So now this is a propositional function x is not a member of x. Now, I mean, notice that even though x occurs twice in there, it's still only a one argument propositional function, right? You just give me one thing and I plug it into both those places. And it gives me a proposition that's either true or false, right? So like if I put u, or like if you give me u, <laughs> Then I put it in for x everywhere, and I give you back u is not a member of u, which is false, because we just saw that u is a member of u. If you give me um, the class of all roses, I give you back the class of all roses is not a member of the class of all roses. That is, the class of all roses is not a rose, which is true. Right, so this is a propositional function. Whatever you give me, I can give you back a proposition, and the proposition is either true or false. And so it has to have an extension. So call the extension R. This is called the Russell class. Right, so R is the class of all classes that are not members of themselves. If you're, familiar with the, if you're familiar with the Barber paradox, I'm sure you can hear the contradiction already coming on its way here, right? R is the class of all classes that are not members of themselves. And then we ask, it's complete. is R a member of itself? Well, I can prove that R is not a member of itself, and I prove by contradiction that R is not a member of itself. And this is how I prove it. Suppose R were a member of itself. Then it would not be true that R is not a member of itself. But this says that R doesn't belong to the extension of that propositional function. Does everyone see why? Right, because this, this is the propositional function that gives true when I plug in things that are not members of themselves. I just show that R is not one of those things. So this shows that R is not a member of itself. And this is a contradiction. Now, I mean, so far, this isn't a paradox because I, I just assumed this for the sake of argument, right? I said, assume for the sake of argument that R is a member of itself. Then I can show that it's not. So, I mean, what that shows is that this couldn't be true because if it were true, you would get a contradiction. So therefore, it shows that the opposite of this must be true. 
namely, it must be true that R is not a member of itself. But then this says that R is does belong to the extension. In other words, this proves that R is a member of itself. Now there's a paradox, because I've proved both that right, I mean one of these has to be true, but no matter but um, but I've shown that whichever one I take, I get a contradiction. So there, right, so there is no good answer to the question whether R belongs to itself. Whatever I answer, I end up contradicting myself. And this is bad. <laughs> As Carnap says, it's the worst thing that can possibly happen. To oh, someone is asking in the chat, what on earth? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, <laughs> Russell, um, there's a famous letter from Russell to Frege where he says, now, I mean, it's actually a little bit more complicated than this. I mean, this type of paradox was already known. It wasn't like Russell was the first one to discover you could get paradoxes this way. But what he did show that, that it followed from Frege's axioms of arithmetic, which, which again, seemed like there couldn't be anything wrong with them. And, you know, he wrote this very short letter to Frege. Dear Frege, I really enjoyed your... Frege had just published this giant book, Grungesetze der Arithmetik, the foundational laws of arithmetic, right? The basic laws of arithmetic. And uh, Russell writes them this letter, Dear Frege, I really enjoyed this huge book you just published, but I noticed that your axiom five leads to a contradiction. And Frege is like, oh, shit. <laughs> anyway, and, and he, I think he wrote back to Russell, arithmetic totters on its foundations. <laughs> So indeed, what on earth, right? So right, so just from these very like simple, again apparently innocent considerations about classes and whatever, you get a contradiction. So Russell's react, Frege's reaction to this was to like complete confusion for a long time. And then he started thinking that maybe he was wrong about certain really fundamental things. Russell's reaction to this was, must have made some like really simple kind of mistake here, I think would be the, the way of characterizing it. Um, because it is so, um, you start with almost nothing and you get this paradox almost immediately saying like somehow we must have been using these words in a way that doesn't make sense or something like that. I'm not sure actually if Russell in this period understands it as a linguistic thing or a conceptual thing, but anyway, that's the way Carnap understands it. it understands Russell's solution. That, that our problem here was that we tried to say something, we were fooled into saying something that didn't make sense. And um, we were fooled because we mixed up objects with quasi-objects, basically. Now, um, so this is the principle, and it's the principle of what's called Russell's theory of types. Um, Carnap states that this is on, in section 37 on page 64. Nothing can be asserted of a class that can be asserted of its elements. And nothing can be asserted of a relation extension that can be asserted of its members. Right, and then he puts in parentheses, 
the well-known theorem of logic that one cannot say of a class either that it does or does not belong to itself is only a special case of this, right? That, that's a well-known theory of what kind of logic? Russell's logic or Russell's set theory. Anyway, Russell's theory of types. Um, but the principle that it's built on is this principle. Nothing can be said, can be asserted of a class that can be asserted of its elements. Now, so what this means is not, nothing can be truly asserted of a class that can be asserted of its elements, but it means, oops, what just happened? Can you hear me? Oh, can you see me? <laughs> uh, Oh, let's see. This is kind of noise. Can switch to this camera. This is almost as good. Uh, okay. Keep talking about this. Let me actually see if it works. Try playing the USB one. Okay, it's hardly worth it. It's almost the same picture. All right, anyway, what was I saying? Nothing can be asserted of a class that can be asserted of its members. Not, it doesn't mean nothing can be truly asserted of the class that can be asserted of its members. It means nothing can be asserted at all of a class that can be asserted of its members, truly or falsely. So in other words, when I, when I write something like this, I'm writing something that couldn't be either true or false. Right? Because is a member of you is something that can be asserted of the members of you. Therefore, it can't be asserted of you. Meaning that this statement is neither true or false, or in other words, it's, it's meaningless, it's nonsense. Right, so that obviously prevents the paradox. I mean, right, because you also, you can't say this. As, you know, um, um, so, so there is no such propositional function as this, and so it has no extension, and so there is no such class as R, and so you can never get started on a paradox. Um, now, I mean, if you say to me, wait, hold on a second, but how about this propositional function, X is a class? And the answer is gonna be, according to Russell, well, this is a propositional function that obviously can, this is something that can be asserted of you. Well, there is no such class as you, but anyway, it can be asserted of the class of all roses, R, for example. And it's true, R is a class.
But that means that it must not be something you can assert about roses. Because again, nothing can be asserted of a class that can be also be asserted of its members. So in other words, we have um, two different levels, basically. We have the level of the original objects, and you can say certain things about them, like, you know, is a rose, you pick some of them out. We can use that to define a class. And we get a whole bunch of classes here. And then we can say certain things about them. Is a class, again, it's a proper class. I don't know actually what Carnap thinks about this class. <laughs> um, but say, um, is a class of, more than three things. Right, so that's true because there's more than three roses, but it's not true of every class. Some classes are classes of three or two or one thing, like the class whose member is this pen, right? So the extension of the propositional function x is Fred. <laughs> so, um, um, so there's certain things, you, you can't say anything like this is a rose about any of these, but there's other things you can say about these. And that will take you up to another level. And so on and so on. So that's why it's called the theory of types because it, there's an infinite number of types of objects. There's the lowest level object, and then there's the next level which consists of classes um, of those objects, and then there's another level which consists of classes of those classes, and so on and so forth. Right, so Ryan says, in Carnap's terminology, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> someone said the computer couldn't handle Russell's paradox. It's true, it kind of makes me think of one of the plots of like the old Star Trek where you, you know, the like energy being has taken over the ship's computer and you, you get rid of it by telling the computer to compute all the digits of pi or something. It's like, does not compute. <laughs> That's probably what happened. Anyway, sorry, getting back to Ryan's question. In Carnap's terminology, would this mean that classes and the elements of classes are allogenous? Or would classes themselves not have their own object spheres due to their designation as quasi-objects? No, no. the first thing you said is right. The, the, the distinction between um, uh, isogenous and allogenous, in German he actually says um, sphärenverwandt, which means like, um, like related in sphere. <laughs> right, like belonging to the same sphere, but they tried to they decide to translate into this kind of fancy sounding English words allogenous and isogenous, right? So anyway, um, so the distinction between allogenous and isogenous is supposed to be exactly the distinction between belong to the same type and belong to different types. And right, this is getting to what I said before how. Carnap is going to say that all four of those issues that I wrote up at the beginning are the same issue. So the issue of do we have a completely different kind of being than another, a different object sphere, um, is Carnap is going to say, yes, we do in the sense that um, the things in, of this kind belong to a different type. So that means, you know, like how that's how is that related to the traditional doctrine of modes of being? It means it's it's supposed to, so to speak worse than belonging to two different species, right? Belong, belonging to two different species in this way of thinking, you can you can think of as belonging to two different classes, right? Like rose and daffodil. 
So a rose is not a daffodil, but is a daffodil can be assertive of a rose. It just gives you something false, right? Not meaningless. And that's how you know that roses and daffodils belong to the same type or they're isogenous. Um, but the class of all roses, you can't even strictly speaking say a rose is not the class of all roses. It's neither true nor false. So they're, more, so to speak, more different from each other than things that are just different in species. That's exactly the traditional ontological doctrine that, that Carnap is trying to um, give new expression to. And, and yeah, and so the fact that, that the class of all roses is a quasi-object relative to roses, meaning that it can be um, eliminated by that procedure I was giving before. And that procedure is basically the reduction procedure that's going to tie the whole constructional system together, right? It can be eliminated. And we can left only talking about roses and not that class. So it's a quasi-object relative to roses, but that exactly is what belonging to a different object sphere or type is about. Okay, so meanwhile, Ryan has asked two more questions. Also, when can you, or maybe you're already going to get to this later, could you go over testing of isogeny? I don't really understand how one grounds the difference in isogeny and isogeny besides just looking at a statement and going, hmm, that's not right. Also, he makes a reference to the multiplicity of suppositions by the schoolmen. Does he mean supposition in the scholastics? I haven't heard them called schoolmen before. Yes, scholastics and schoolmen are the same people. Yes. Um, suppositions, however, may not be exactly the right scholastic terminology. Uh, um, well... Or I guess, it, but he's connecting two things that in the minds of the scholastics were not necessarily connected. Hmm. Anyway, um, yeah, scholastics and schoolmen of it uh, are the same people. Um, so, and as far as testing, yeah, I will say a little bit about that later but um but it is gonna have to be i mean when we do when russell does this in the foundations of arithmetic he doesn't have to appeal to anything about hmm, that doesn't look right right like he introduces the base you know the null sets and whatever and uh um and uh, and based on that, he's, he's able to introduce all the types in such a way that it's clear to begin with that they belong to different types and whatever. But um, Carnap, as he keeps saying, is trying to take this apparatus that Russell developed for use in the foundations of mathematics. I mean, I think Russell could, agreed that it could be used for other things too, but he didn't really work on that very much. So Carnap is trying to take this apparatus that Russell developed for that purpose and apply it to the whole realm of objects discussed in science. And as I've mentioned before, there isn't a real sharp boundary between science and common sense, I think, for logical positivists. So it just means the realm of like everything we sensibly talk about. Um, and how are we going to know if we did it right? Yeah, we're going to have to rely on our kind of pre-existing knowledge of which things make sense and which don't. So that raises certain methodological problems, which I'm going to get back to later, probably in a later lecture. But um, that's, the, that's the brief answer to, to what you're asking. Okay, so um, 
Right, so this theory of types, you know, avoids the known paradoxes. Um, if you hoped you could show that there won't be any other paradoxes, Gödel will show that that's impossible. <laughs> um, but so uh, we can't be sure that there aren't still other paradoxes in arithmetic that we don't know about. <laughs> but, um, but this solution avoids all the known paradoxes. Um, and Carnap, at least, is convinced, at least in 1928, Carnap is convinced that this is the only solution. Now, whether he's right about that is a complicated question, I guess. I used to say, now we know he's wrong about this because there are other versions of axiomatized set theory. And in fact, people don't use the theory of types very much anymore. It's kind of difficult to work with. There's other versions of axiomatized set theory that also avoid all the known paradoxes, but are a lot easier to, to use. Um, the uh, the thing is, though, um, those other systems are kind of ad hoc. Like, even though they're much more popular because they're easier to use, they're not really justified in any way, right? Like someone just says, hey, here's some axioms, and if you use this, you'll avoid the paradox. It's basically just telling you, don't say that. <laughs> and you won't get a paradox. So um, um, it's not so clear that there's another approach that has an explanation for why you shouldn't say it. And the explanation for why you shouldn't say it is exactly this thing about fictitious quasi-objects, right? Which in Russell's version is called the no-class theory. No class theory. So, I mean, this, and uh, Russell is not averse to metaphysics in the way Carnap is, quite on the contrary. Oops, sorry. So, in Russell's mind, I think this means there is no such thing as a class. Carnap, as we've seen, says something that sounds like this, like that. These are fictitious quasi objects. But, and it's really important to pay attention to this, he says, that's a mere logical distinction, and it only holds once we've chosen a certain system form. It's not a metaphysical difference between different objects, some of which really exist and the others don't. Actually, he says, on the contrary, in the constructional system, the way it says, ah, all the things that we usually say really exist are going to turn out, you know, like this pen, are going to turn out to be quasi-objects. So quasi-objects really exist. <laughs> but beyond that, we could choose a different system with a different basis, and then the things that are quasi-objects now would be the objects, and the things that are the objects now would be quasi-objects. So, um, so Carnap wants to avoid this metaphysical thesis, but he does want to use what I think in Russell's mind is a way of getting at that metaphysical thesis, namely, um, again, the fact that you can say, or at least the supposed fact that you can say everything you wanted to say using classes without having to say that there are any classes. Um, at least without having to use any names for classes. But I think um, Russell and Carnap, and it's kind of makes sense that the things that you're talking about are the things that you have names for. Quine completely disagrees with that later on. But in any case, that's the way they're thinking about it. You can use it without any names of, you can say everything you wanted to say without having any names for classes. Um, 
Um, and they take that to mean, or in Carnap's version, at least relative to this choice of system form, that the names of classes are just useful symbols. They're just useful abbreviations for things we could have said without them. Right, so in other words, you know, to use the example I did before, to write for all x, if x is a rose, then x is a flower. Well, of course, this isn't that bad, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's still a lot more complicated than this. And obviously, if you want to start saying complicated things about classes, the, this version is going to get longer and longer really fast. So, um, well, maybe that's not obvious to you, but I'll tell you it's true. <laughs> so, um, so it's convenient to be able to write this instead of that. But we're allowed to do it because we always know how to go back to that. Because we just introduced these as like easier ways of saying stuff like that. And this explains why you can't, right? It doesn't just, it's not just don't say it because you'll get a paradox. It explains why you can't assert anything of a class than you can assert of its members. Because um, the, the names of classes had to be introduced as ways of saying things that before we could say without them. So, um, right, so if we have some propositional function and we say, you know, um, say A is a member of the extension of phi, um, this better be something we could have said before we introduced the class names. It's kind of like it's related to this kind of, you know, geeky joke about like, you know, like the name of the operating system, GNU, it's supposed to stand for GNU's not Unix. So and then you expand it, you get. The, the acronym doesn't go away, you just get it again, <laughs> um, which obviously is not the way acronyms are supposed to work. Uh -huh. um, so, right, so, but like in this case, we're, we're saying, come on, but seriously, that's not the way acronyms or abbreviations work. An abbreviation you have to be able to get rid of and replace it with only the stuff you were abbreviating, meaning the stuff you could say before you had the abbreviation. Okay, someone says, I don't think I understand this formula. This formula? Okay, so phi, I mean, do you, like, do you understand this formula? And if you don't, please say no. <laughs> Because if you don't, a lot of other people don't. You don't understand, is it because you can't read my writing maybe? This is the membership symbol, right? A is a member of the extension of X is a rose. What is that symbol with the line? Oh, this? This is A. <laughs> All right, that's a lowercase a. <laughs> I just rewrote it another way. And this is the this is the set membership symbol. It's like an e. A is a member of, and this means the extension of the propositional function x is a rose. And then I wrote phi as it's called a syntactic variable. P stands for just some propositional function. I don't know what it is. 
right? So this means A is a member of the extension of phi. Oh, this thing. You don't know what this is. Yeah, this is the this is a Greek letter, capital P. It's traditional to use it here, but um, yeah, I'm gonna leave it there. I just because it is traditional to use it. It's a capital P. All right. Sorry. I mean, it's there's a lot of interesting issues about the use of symbolism in mathematics and physics. Like you would think it's arbitrary. I could use any letter I want there, right? It just stands for something I know not what. But no, it would be very confusing if I started using F and G there instead of V and C. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, uh, right, so the point is whatever the propositional function this is, I have to be able to say it without mentioning names of classes or else this like abbreviation system is, is uh, I won't be able to de-abbreviate, <laughs> right? Um, so in particular, you know, um, this propositional function can't be something like X is a member of itself, right? Because this member of is part of the abbreviation system that we're introducing. So it can't be in the propositional function that we're doing it to. And, you know, like, sure enough, if you try, so if you write something like, The extension of this propositional function is a member of itself. Then you get this propositional function applies to its own extension, truly. And you haven't gotten rid of the class name. It's still there. So this is so so like so as far as Carnap is concerned, this shows that Russell didn't just tell us something to do so we wouldn't end up saying the paradox. Russell pointed out the confusion we were under, the mistake we made that led us to the paradox, which is what you hope for when you get rid of a paradox. I mean, unless you're a Hegelian, which Russell used to be before he was Russell. And that's probably what made him so sensitive to this type of paradox. But anyway, um, right, so when you, when you get rid of a paradox, in the end, you want to not just say, well, don't, don't say it, because it's neither true nor false. You want to say, look, you weren't really saying something at all, that, and here's your mistake. And that's what this is supposed to do. And like I said, it's not so clear that Carnap would be wrong if he, if he said, this is the only solution like that to the Russell paradox. Maybe it still is. Okay, so all of that was, well, I mean, I said a little bit about point two, and obviously it is related to point three about meaningfulness of language, right? Like how we know in advance that, um, that a statement like this is not meaningful um, so that we won't start trying to figure out if it's true or false. According to Russell and according to Carnap, we can tell it's not meaningful if we pay attention to the way this symbol was first introduced. Um, and um, if we start with some symbols that we know are okay somehow, <laughs> um, and then we're very careful about how we introduce new symbols and we go level by level and don't get into this confusion, then we'll end up saying th only things that are meaningful and we're guaranteed that they're either true or false. One or the other and not both. <laughs> okay. 
Um, however, all right, obviously I'm going to have to talk about some of this next time because there's only 10 minutes left, but I'm going to get started on it at least. Um, I want to bring this back to how it's related to point four about epistemology and science, according to Karna. So, um, Right, epistemology. I guess I shouldn't assume everyone knows what epistemology means. It's it's the supposed branch of philosophy that's about knowledge, about what we know, if anything, and how, if we know anything, how we know it, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, uh, it's you know, um, not even though it's from Greek roots, it's not actually an ancient word. It was introduced and then. Um, Mid, ninth, mid to late 19th century. Um, but in any case, um, right, so an epistemological, epistemological problem is a problem about what we can know or um, Carnap is going to want to turn that into a question of like what can we responsibly talk about? What can we claim assert things about? Um, So the claim that makes all that set or class theory stuff related to philosophy of science and epistemology at all is the claim that Carnap, well, I mean, it's two claims that Carnap makes, basically. The first is that all the objects of science, so I'm going to actually write them separately. All the objects of science form a single type hierarchy. This is what, or it's, it's, it's the first thing that Kanyat means by the unity of science. As he goes on, he adjusts what how science is going to be unified a little bit, although it's never that different from this, but uh, um, but it's whatever it means, it's always really important to him. What it means at this point, again, is that all the objects that we talk about in science, all are members of a single type hierarchy, meaning there's some basic objects, And then everything else that science talks about it all consists of quasi-objects relative to those basic objects. So all the other things that science talks about are, for example, classes of those basic objects, or classes of classes of those basic objects, or relation extensions of you know, ordered pairs of those basic objects, etc. Now, like, what do we mean by all the objects of science? How do we know what all the objects of science are? Okay, there were two questions here. One, or no, there are three questions. One was just question mark, question mark, question mark, which I hope I can help with. The other two are Wait, he's suggesting that other type of hierarchies even exist. It's not clear what it means that a type hierarchy exists or doesn't exist, right? I mean, a type hierarchy, especially like the way Carnap thinks about it, it's a kind of like language system. Um, it's uh, so you can set up different ones if you want, and they're not the same as each other. Um, do they really exist? Like that's a metaphysical question that Carnap is, doesn't want to allow. Um, he doesn't want to allow that. It, it is, if it means, do the objects in that hierarchy really exist? 
are the names of the objects or and or of the quasi objects, names of things that really exist, Carnap is going to say that question doesn't make sense. Um, um, but what he does suggest, and he suggests in this reading, is that the objects of science themselves can be put into more than one type hierarchy. Right at the end of the reading for today, he spends a lot of time talking about the choice of system form, which also involves the choice of basis. Right, and it, like according to one system form, the basis is going to consist of my fundamental experiences. Who am I? Well, I guess the one who's setting up the constructional system, right, or whoever's using it. Or anyway, the basis is going to consist of my fundamental experiences. And, you know, those are going to be the objects. And then all kinds of other things like um, my sense modality is my, you know, sensations, um, physical things like pens, tables, other people's psychological states, etc. Those are all going to be quasi objects. But he says, oh, well, we could also choose a different system where the basis consists of fundamental particles and fields. And those are the objects. And then my fundamental experiences, your fundamental experiences, tables, pens, all that stuff, those are all quasi-objects relative to those fundamental particles and fields. So there's more than one way of organizing all the objects of science into a type hierarchy. So maybe I should say something like form at least one single type hierarchy, but um, um, but the fact that you can do that somehow is very important to him. Before before he gets to the second step, which is what the, the moreover a certain type of type hierarchy is also a certain kind of type hierarchy is also is possible namely the one he's going to set up in this book um, but yeah i think i'm going to talk about that next time cuz i just want to like finish my thought about this what are all the objects of science? So that like the test, and Carnap says, you know, the, the construction system must pass tests. And the test it must pass is, the test it must pass is that, or at least one of the tests it must pass is, it must find a place for all the objects of science in the system. If it can't find some of them, the constructional theory has failed. So what exactly, where do we get that? And yeah, I'm sorry, Ryan, I see I asked you a question, but I'm not gonna get to that. Because um, the answer is complicated. But um, um, where do we get this, so to speak, list of objects that have to find their way into the constructional system? So the answer is, we have to already know what science is. Right, in other words, the purpose of the constructional system is not going to be to decide um, how many things are sciences and how and which things are not sciences. You might say, wait, isn't it supposed to rule out metaphysics? Yes, it's supposed to rule out metaphysics, but the way that's going to work, and I will talk about this next time, <laughs> I'm basically out of time, but the way it's supposed to work is that metaphysics is supposed to rule itself out, right? Like metaphysics is supposed to say, no, uh, we don't intend to be part of that hierarchy. So any way you put us in there, we're going to say you misunderstood us, right? So, but for anyone who doesn't say that, like, you know, Carnap basically, uh, the position we're in, and this is the position he describes in the preface, and it's the position I described of the position of modern philosophy with respect to science, basically, 
we're confronted with science already existing. We see that it's especially responsible or something, at least that's Carnap's diagnosis of what's going on. We want to explain exactly what that consists in in order to learn something from it for philosophy. So, um, so yeah, we're picking up sciences as we find them, taking their word for it for what kind of objects there are, and then trying to set up a system that will include all those objects. And in fact, uh, the logical positivists um, tend to be, number one, relatively, well, they tend to be relatively liberal about what they'll count as sciences. Some might even say uh, kind of gullible, right? Like Carnap is willing to include handwriting analysis. Um, you notice that he sometimes uses names of races as examples of scientific concepts. Um, I don't think he's a racist in the sense that he holds explicit racist beliefs, like some races are better than others, but he doesn't have the re any resources to say race is just a bad concept. We shouldn't have gotten going thinking that way, right? If scientists are using it, it's got to find a place in the system. Um, so that's the situation here, and uh, I, w I have more to say, but <laughs> I'm two minutes over, so I will see you on Thursday. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.